All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bridget Terry Long, and I am the SARS Professor of Education and Economics here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Welcome to the first Ask With debate of this semester. I want to recognize that many are joining us online as well, um, in addition to uh, the audience that we have here. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to say a few words about the Ask With Debates for those who have not been able to attend previously. The Ask With Debates were launched in 2016 with two goals. The first, to showcase leading thinkers exploring multiple angles of a controversial topic. And the second, to provide examples of civil and respectful discourse uh, to our students and broader community. The Ask With Forums and Debates help strengthen the intellectual life here at HGSE through conversation, debate, and the exchange of ideas. You may have noticed uh, some advertisements for upcoming forums. Next week, we're going to have three of them uh, from the Little Rock Nine, who desegregated Central High School 60 years ago, to a discussion about immigration in DACA, and talks by the recipients uh, of prizes for education development and education research. So please keep uh, your eyes open for those. And now back to the important conversation we're going to have this evening. So here this evening, we're, uh, we're going to talk about higher education. And no doubt, post-secondary education is very important. Uh -huh. While we might debate the returns of one college versus another or certain kinds of degrees, there's no question in the research and in the labor market trends uh, that a high school degree is not enough for most Americans to be able to support themselves. And while there is still some debate about framing it as college for all, uh, we certainly do not see families with resources suggesting that we should uh, accept the notion that their kids should not go to college. Especially in a rapidly changing world, a degree, a certificate, or at least targeted coursework in a post-secondary institution is needed to continually adapt and have the skills necessary to make a meaningful wage and enjoy financial security along with a host of other benefits. And while we spend a lot of time, the media in particular, uh, on really selective, big private institutions, public research universities, the community colleges are truly the backbone of the American higher education system. Community colleges serve a diverse set of needs and goals, including providing a second chance to students who struggled in high school, uh, providing workforce training and retraining and retraining um, all throughout the lives of workers, preparing students to transfer to a four-year institution as a low-cost way to get a bachelor's degree, awarding certificates and associate's degrees, and a host of other community programs um, and non-credit courses that oftentimes we don't notice. But the story is even more telling when you realize the share of the population that depends on community colleges as their point of entry for more education after high school. In fall 2014, community colleges educated 42% of all undergraduates. And among students of color, that number is even higher. That year, community colleges educated 44% of black students. And the majority of Hispanic and Native American students went to community colleges, with 56% of those groups uh, attending in 2014. Community colleges are also the institutions that serve the bulk of low-income students. One in three community college students have family incomes less than $20,000. That's one in three, meaning that these are students who are near or below the poverty line. So if we are serious about making progress in educating our population, and we hold true to the ideal of, of social mobility, we have to support the work of community colleges. But that's not what is currently happening. While four-year colleges and universities have been struggling in terms of their funding, they still have it much better than the community college system. Between 1999 and 2009, funding for, for public research universities exceeded the funding for community colleges $4,000 to one per student. It's $4,000 to one per student. Another work has documented just how reductions in funding have translated into fewer resources for community colleges. After accounting for inflation, instructional expenditures per full-time equivalent student fell 12% at community colleges from 2001 to 2011, with additional reductions in expenditures on student services and academic supports. So it's not surprising, given the limited resources and the needs of the populations they serve, that many community colleges are falling short of their goals. Only 39% of first-time college students who entered a community college completed any kind of credential at any institution within six years. 
Now, research that I've done with McCall Curlander at UC Davis, we make the case that it's not appropriate to just compare the outcomes of community colleges to other institutions and to fault them, given the students they're serving. And we do have to acknowledge the fact that many students who attend community colleges don't do so with the intention of getting a degree. But there's no question many students struggle to reach their goals because of lack of supports, confusing and inadequate systems, affordability challenges, and a host of other reasons. Now, far too many institutions, both two years and four years, have a student completion problem. But in order to move the needle and make progress, community colleges know they must address a wide range of circumstances, challenges, assets, and competing demands. For example, at community colleges, 69% of students work and 33% of, of students are working full time. So recently, one solution that's received a lot of attention is free college. The reasoning is if we could just address the tuition costs, then maybe we can improve student outcomes. We heard this during the presidential debate and campaigns. We saw, we've seen it happen in other countries. We've even had a few states who've implemented uh, these kinds of plans in the last few years. The idea of free college has captured the attention of the country. But the free college movement doesn't present an easy and quick fix. And many wonder if it's politically and financially fe uh, feasible. Recently, even Oregon, who had to backtrack um, on making tuition free for new community college students after high demand and limited funding stretched the budget too thin. Moreover, a free college policy would not, not, not address all the challenges that students face and may in fact create new challenges for community colleges. So tonight we're going to consider what would we gain with free college, but also what else could be done or should be done to help students. What do we need to consider to make real improvements for community college students? And so in just a second, I'm going to open up with some questions for the panelists. Um, and at the end, we're gonna to try to save some time so we can entertain questions from the audience. Um, so here, let me introduce the panelists. I'm gonna ask if you could save your applause for the end to try to save a little bit of time and make sure that we uh, can have as full of discussion as possible. Uh, to start, uh, we have Andrew Kelly, uh, who is the Senior Vice President for Strategy and Policy of the University of North Carolina System. In his work with UNC President Margaret Spellings, Andrew is tasked with enhancing and furthering the UNC's strategic goals. Prior to, enjo to joining UNC, er uh, Andrew was the former director of the Center on Higher Education Reform at the American Enterprise Institute. He's published work in academic journals and popular outlets such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Next to him, we have Professor David Deming, my colleague here at the Ed School. He also has an appointment as Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, David is Director of the Inequality and Social Policy Program and also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. His research includes work on the growth of inequality in the United States, the impact of for-profit colleges on student outcomes, and the effectiveness of policies meant to improve degree completion. Recently, he co-founded the CLIMB Initiative, which is a partnership between researchers, policymakers, and a diverse group of colleges and universities with the goal of understanding the role of higher education and fostering social mobility. And then we have Josh Weiner, who is founder and executive director of the College Excellence Program at the Aspen Institute, where he also serves as a vice president. The College Excellence Program aims to advance higher education practices, policies, and leadership that significantly improve outcomes for students. Josh has authored numerous publications, including a book, What Excellent Community Colleges Do, Preparing All Students for Success, which was published by the Harvard Education Press in 2014. Josh is also an instrumental part of the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence, which has become the nation's signature recognition of high achievement and performance among our community colleges. And then finally, we have Deborah Santiago, who is co-founder, chief operating officer, and vice president for policy at, at Excelencia in Education. For more than 20 years, she has led research and policy efforts to improve educational opportunities and success for all students. Among, among her experiences, Deborah has worked in the federal government as a policy analyst, and she served as the deputy director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanic Americans. 
Deborah is an Aspen Institute Pahara Fellow and serves on the board of the organization The Dream Dadas. And now please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Thank you. So I'm happy to join them here on stage, and I'm going to kick them off with a couple of questions. <laughs> okay, we are, are going to start uh, and with having our panelists give some introductory comments. And the question I'm posing to them, given the framing of the uh, panel tonight, um, do you think free college is the best way to go if we're trying to support community college students? And beyond that, in the debate that's been ongoing now for the last 18 months, what do you think hasn't been considered um, in, that, in that debate that we need to take into account? A softball, easy one. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, uh, first I want to say I'm honored to, to be here, um, uh, especially to be invited by somebody like Bridget, whose work I followed for years and have known for years um, yeah. and think, uh, think the world. It's hard to find somebody who's had more of an influence on higher ed policy and discussions than Bridget. Um, Sorry, David. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and also to be here with some of my favorite colleagues, um, who I don't see nearly enough of anymore now that I moved to, uh, to, to North Carolina. Um, uh, these are the folks that can drag me up here on a snowy afternoon. So, um, so honored to be here. It uh, goes without saying, these are my views, not my employers. My employer is the University of North Carolina system. Uh, we oversee the, four, uh, the 16 four-year colleges and universities in North Carolina and one school of science and math, a high school, uh, for, for a magnet school for students. We have everything from a flagship research institution, Chapel Hill, uh, NC State, a very high-powered uh, research institution. We have five public HBCUs, um, and we have an arts conservatory. So we have pretty much everything uh, you could ask for in a, in a, a system of higher education. So uh, my views, not my employers. I have the best job in, in uh, the world, though, I think. I, my job is I wake up every morning and think about how to get more kids to and through uh, the UNC system. Um, and uh, I think the through is the piece that the free college movement has not paid nearly enough attention to. Um, and so I want to make three points uh, in that regard. Um, the first is that uh, uh, free college aims to fix the wrong problem, in my opinion. Um, it focuses on affordability when student success is the more pressing challenge. Um, and in the process, it may even make it more difficult to focus on student success um, by, by potentially starving institutions of resources. And that's the second point. A uh, free college program would put uh, strain on public budget, uh, public budgets, um, which will in turn affect institutional capacity in ways that, again, will make it harder to increase student success rates um, to, uh, to serve students and serve them well. And then third, you know, the free college uh, debate doesn't pay s uh, sufficient attention um, to the unintended consequences uh, for student choice um, and student success uh, of, of, of creating a free public option. So uh, the first point, aims are the wrong problem. Um, you know, you, if you look at uh, data on net price of attendance, uh, it's true that, that, that most students, many students who attend um, community colleges are low income. They qualify for a Pell Grant. Um, that's why we should pay attention to student success rates there in particular, but it's also why those students often don't pay any, anything by way of tuition um, to attend a community college in the first place. So the free tuition uh, programs would uh, actually not deliver additional benefits to those students because their Pell Grant would, uh, uh, already covers the cost of, of tuition, and that's essentially what you see in Tennessee. Uh, the lowest income students in Tennessee, their tuition is covered by their Pell Grant. Um, and so what you wind up with is a system where it's a windfall for middle class and upper middle class students who would likely have paid anyway to attend community college, um, but the free tuition benefit, the buy down, if you will, um, goes to them uh, as opposed to, the, to lower income students. Now, everybody faces living expenses and so on, so I'm not suggesting that it's free, free to go, uh, but, but most of the plans we've been discussing are free tuition plans. So. Um, I will say that that's part of the logic, though. So I want to make, make clear that part of the logic of the folks who are advocating for free college, and I think it's actually smart uh, in, in many respects, is part of the logic is that universal programs are easier to understand and use, and they're also insulated often from, from political changes, right? So means-tested programs, there's been pretty good evidence in, in political science in particular that means-tested programs are often even more easily targeted for, um, for cuts and so on. So I do, I do think it's important to acknowledge that uh, some of the advocates don't see the windfall to, to the broader population as a bug, but as a feature, all right? So the second thing, the second point, it, it's related, is, um, you know, a free college uh, uh, program puts a cap on tuition, essentially, right? Which says, really, what it really says is that what an institution has available to spend is dependent entirely on what the public is willing to invest, all right? 
So no longer can an institution raise additional revenue from via tuition or via, via recruiting more students. It's entirely based on how much the legislature, if it's the state, uh, uh, is willing to, willing to invest. So the problem with that is if, uh, if legislative generosity or public generosity doesn't keep pace with growth in enrollments or changes you know, in the cost of delivery, um, uh, institutions are faced with a choice. They can either ration access because they don't have the money to enroll additional students um, or they can degrade quality, right? They can sort of, you know, uh, lower the quality of the product they're offering, which of course has implications for student success. Examples of this abound. You know, in the middle of the recession, the California community colleges, they have among the lowest co community college tuition in the country, and that's fixed and capped. As a result, when the recession hit and state funding dropped and, and more and more students were arriving at their door, they had to turn away students, right? So they turned away, estimates suggest around 600,000 students over the course of the recession. They reduced course offerings by about 20%, right? So, so ironically, right, this push for free college, and you can see this actually in, in um, the experience in England, right? So England actually went in the opposite direction. They had free tuition for many years. There were, there were concerns, including among progressives, that not enough low-income students were getting access to the British university system. So they actually freed up um, uh, tuition pricing created loan program, and access has gone up, and completion has gone up uh, for, for low-income students in particular. Okay, Andrew, two really great points. Yes, I, I can stop there. I want to make sure I can bring another. I'm going to give you there. additional chances to talk. Absolutely. Don't worry. I'll stop there. Okay. I, want to pass I figured I wanted to get it all in before these guys started. <laughs> <laughs> Take over. Uh, so thank you. Also very pleased to be here with you all. Um, you know, I thought long and hard about this too, because we deal a great deal with populations, very low income, first generation, um, and a lot of public policy work is so focused on access. So three reasons I think that um, free college uh, is good, and then three reasons why I think we're missing the boat on core issues and challenges that are still there. So I think it's a simple and a clear message. And you don't want to underestimate that, especially with populations that believe college is college, you don't even know that it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And to say something like that is really powerful, right? Like educating all, it's a great sentiment. There's some challenges there. But, so I do think it's a simple, clear message. You get it, people think free, so that's something. Second, I think it addresses the issue we believe research has found why students don't go or complete. And time and time again, we hear it's about affordability. And so it tries to address that. How we define affordability, that's another issue, right? But so these are the positives, right? And the third, I think, is um, in some ways we're looking at public investment in higher ed at a time where we've seen some retrenchment, some could argue, depending on states. Uh, but we're seeing an infusion and in investment in, in higher education and community colleges, uh, although really interested and focused on individuals. So I think there's a lot of positive in the way it's framed and the messaging. And we live in public policy. It's all how you frame it, right? It's all the acronym. It's how you talk about it. The devil is always in the details. And I think uh, we want to have a rigorous discussion about the details. Because, you know, how do you, how do you define affordability? If it's just tuition, and I completely agree with Andrew's point, then is it really addressing the students who have the largest need if they're already being covered with federal aid? Uh, things like transportation, childcare, food insecurity, those issues aren't really addressed in many of the programs that we've looked at, per se. So for defining affordability as tuition and fees uh, doesn't get you the whole enchilada, as it were, and right, we were, the intent behind a clear and simple message. Um, so I think that hasn't been considered. I think secondly, um, the idea of providing access with free college makes a lot of sense. Um, it's like this idea of equal opportunity that we all are so committed to. But I think the challenge comes in, uh, is equal opportunity enough? I think we have to acknowledge where we are today that you know, this doesn't necessarily address equitable opportunity. And just like it, it's equal opportunity because we're treating everybody the same, we're, we're, it's free for everyone, doesn't address those components. And that speaks to student success, about the wraparound support that's needed for students, and fundamentally the assumption that we all starting from the same place. And I think there are lost opportunities, especially in public policy when we all believe we need that silver bullet. And if the silver bullet is free college, then you know, we, can, we can drop the mic, we did our bit. Right? Um, you know, we say, you know, that student's in the door, and it's like, que vayan con Dios, we got you in, it's up to you to get through. And that, that sends a message that's incomplete, and it feels like a false promise. 
and if we don't address some of that equitable component, then maybe uh, we're doing a disservice since free college idea. And I guess the, the a third part of this is um, it doesn't address the issue of quality because the resources are on behalf of the, in, the individual student, right? And I worry that, uh, you know, so the institutions don't have the opportunity to address quality in quite the same way if they're chasing after student access and are we addressing the quality of the institutions students are going to in a way that allows them to, to gain the full promise of what we're trying to offer and that is a quality college education, to be a good citizen, to be effective, be a good employee, to have a strong workforce. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Josh? Um, yeah, so I agree with a lot of what's been said. I, I think free college, I'm for it, because I think it's a simple, blunt instrument to get towards some increased public investment, as Andrew, you suggested. It's not a bug, but it's an asset but also to ensure greater access. And it's dealing with affordability in a general sense. And it's not dealing with a lot of these other issues, but the notion that if we expand access and public investment and higher ed, that all these other issues are gonna go away, I just don't buy. I mean, fundamentally, we can do multiple things at the same time. And so let's talk a little bit about, so I, I'm all for free community college and free college. I think it's a good way. I mean, imagine a world where we didn't have free high school right, where that was means tested. I mean, just imagine the world today in this political climate where that was the case, right? We're trying to flip that script. Doesn't mean we don't, you know, because we have free high school doesn't mean we're not trying to improve the quality of high school or improve graduation rates. So, so to me, I think it's sort of to say that it doesn't address that issue is, of course it doesn't address that issue. There are other ways we have to address that issue. So I think when we think about what we need to do at the same time we're thinking about free college, I think there are two, fundamental things we need to do. One is we've got to raise the sites of community colleges just one step further. So for 50 years, community colleges were access expanding institutions. It was all about access to workforce development and access to the first two years of a bachelor's degree. And we did a great job of that. Mm -hmm. And then about 15 years ago, we woke up and we realized that we have about a 30% completion rate. You know, we can argue about whether it's 40% if you include transfer, but it wasn't good. Access isn't enough. So we moved from what I call 1.0 access to community college 2.0, access plus completion, right? And so we've got to work on completion. We're not gonna do that through the financing mechanism. Uh, we'll talk about how we get there. I think it's fundamentally a matter of leadership and data use, but, but, but I'll talk about that later. But now we need to raise the sites of community colleges. If we really want the institutions to be engines of social mobility and talent development, which is what I think they are at their best, we've got to raise our sites to post-graduation success for community college students. There are two places they go. We know that they transfer to four-year schools, and unfortunately only about 40% ever get to a four-year school, even though 80% say that's what they want. And we've got to make sure they graduate with a bachelor's degree only 15 or 20% ever get a bachelor's degree, folks, who start in community college. So we've gotta, we've gotta deal with that issue as a quality issue. Again, I don't think free community college is gonna have an impact on it either way, frankly. Um, and, and then number two, they've gotta go to the workforce. So many students are in career and technical education programs, you know, from welding to, um, to uh, allied health professions to information technology degrees with, that have freestanding labor market value. The problem there is we know about from Tony Carnevale's research at Georgetown that about half of the credentials that community colleges confer don't yield family sustaining wages. They require the completion of a bachelor's degree or they're in areas of the workforce that are low wage work. So I think we fundamentally got to raise the sites of community colleges from to 3.0 which is access and I think free college helps with that. Completion, I think free college can help with that. But post-graduation success, and I think we've got to address that through other means, and I'll talk about that uh, a, a little later. So that, that, that to me is the big challenge, but I think suggesting that the free college movement is gonna address that issue, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's gonna have much of an impact either way. Okay, thank you, Josh. All right, David, I gave you the, the tough job. Yeah, what uh, haven't we already said? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, thanks, Bridget. Thanks, everybody. It, it's a treat to be here with you guys today. Um, I think um, to answer the question, about whether free college is a good idea, whether it's worth supporting, depends very much on the frame in which you're operating. So um, I'm, a, I'm an economist. 
I work on education. I think a lot about benefit, sort of hard-headed benefit cost calculations. Societal resources are scarce. How should we use them? And if you're asking me the question, you know, among competing public priorities, where does edu higher education rank? I think it should rank much higher than it currently does. So I think that we as states and as the federal government should be spending more investing in the skill development of our society. I think that was true 100 years ago. It's even more true now because work is more focused on what's up here and less focused on machines and, and, and all those things. And so I think we should be, as a nation, prioritizing higher education. So that's a question about resources going from you know, important things like healthcare and social services toward education. I actually think we should do that. Then there's a second question, which is give me a fixed pot of money and how should I use it within the higher education space? And there I think the answer is more complicated because the goal, as Andrew started to, to, to talk about, is the goal is not make college as cheap as possible. The goal is produce as much educational value as you can with the resources you have. And that includes completion, but it also includes learning or what happens when you, you know, it's not just completing a degree if the degree isn't teaching you anything, it's also looking at labor market outcomes and other things that are kind of ultimate measures of wh whether or one sort of ultimate measure of whether you learned anything in school and whether it was worthwhile. And so the question becomes, is making college free, holding resources constant the way to do that? And I think it isn't. And I think the reason it isn't is because when most people think about the value of a college education, they're fixating on the price. But the other thing is, what are you getting for your money? And the worry I have with free college is if we, have, if we hold resources constant and we lower the price to zero, we get a lot more students in there. But the, it's the, still the same pool of resources divided over many more people. And so if resources matter at all, and we have lots of reasons to think they do, then what's going to happen? It's going to be larger classes, less student support. You can't get into the classes you want. This is the California story and the story that's re replicating itself in many other states. And so I think we have to think about that, which is how do we get more people through? How do we increase? I mean, there's one thing, which is how do we make sure that society prioritizes education so we spend more money? I'd be for free college if we could pay for it. But if we can't pay for it, how do we make resources go farther? And there I think we really need to think creatively about whether um, the federal government can do something to support states spending on the quality aspects of higher ed, something I'm happy to talk about more as we go on. Okay. I think David's kind of setting up the next stage, so. Clean up. <laughs> Thank well you. Well done. Um, you know, one thing I really pride myself about with this community that I absolutely love, it's not enough to just complain about what the problems are. We actually do want to pivot and say, okay, if free college is not the perfect policy, and there are many things we could do to support community college students, what could we do? And so that's what I've really pressed the panel in our preparation. What could we do to improve uh, outcomes for community college students? So I'm gonna pass it back to them and say, if not free college, then what? What would you prioritize in terms of investments to try to improve outcomes for community college students? I'm gonna start again. Go for it. All right, man, I get first crack at this. I appreciate the <laughs> statement about not just complaining about problems, but actually solving some of them. I've had to make that transition from working at a think tank to now working for a system of higher education. So um, make no mistake, it's much harder to figure out the solutions. Um, so if only there were one silver bullet, right, to figuring out the, 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 the issues that face our community colleges. You know, I think the easy answer that somebody might say is they might pull off the shelf, you know, the latest uh, work from MDRC where they studied an intervention at, at CUNY uh, community College uh, Accelerated Study and Associate Program, um, ASAP. Um, you know, I think I think the the outcomes from ASAP are remarkable. Um, it passes a cost benefit test, as far as you, we can tell from MDRC. I think. The, Why don't you describe a little bit about what ASAP sure. is? Sure. So ASAP is really kind of a cocktail of interventions, if you will. It's sort of a it's sort of a mix of things. It brings a group of community college students together, typically those who are eligible for de developmental education, puts them into a cohort. They go to school in a block schedule. They get a tuition waiver. They have to enroll full time. They get a Metro card, they get free books, they get, I'm probably missing a few things, but they get pretty much every support, you know, that they can, there's a bunch of extra advising and counseling. And they found that ASAP, you know, essentially doubles graduation rates, um, you know, in a, in a pretty, in, they found it over a three year span, it doubles graduation rates on a three year graduation rate. So um, pretty impressive. The cost up front is more expensive, but the cost per degree is much lower, right? Because you're producing a lot more graduates. But I think the, I think the issue there is a couple things. Number one, we don't know what's really doing all the work, right? It would be nice to actually know kind of a little bit more about which of those levers are really moving the needle. Um, and then also, you know, like uh, scaling that in a different place. You know, ASAP, people don't necessarily know this, but ASAP was homegrown. ASAP was born at CUNY, and then MDRC came in to evaluate it. So the CUNY people have been at ASAP for a long time, and they built it. So I'm always a little skeptical that you can just take something like that off the shelf and implement it somewhere else. Not, not that it's not worth trying, right? But, but I think I'd be a little skeptical. So 
if I'm if I'm forced to choose, I'm going to say guided pathways with significant advising. Um, so you know, I think, and this is where I think Tom Bailey and his colleagues, the book that they wrote about redesigning community colleges, are most compelling. The current model is a cafeteria model, right? Students come in, students who are often struggling in high school come in and they can sort of pick and choose. It's a smorgasbord of course offerings and so on. They don't necessarily pick a program from the start uh, that they, and then there's no program map that follows them all the way, that guides them all the way through along with some active intrusive advising. Um, the one thing I will say as somebody who sits at a four year college system, I think the pathways to Josh's point, they need to be seamless pathways all the way through to a bachelor's degree. I think, we, I think uh, the guided pathways work has done a lot in terms of making the path to the associate's degree clear. Um, not so much, I think, on the transfer pathway. And I would just shout out a couple of our institutions as a shameless plug. Um, you know, UNC Greensboro has signed on to co-admission uh, agreements with Rockingham Community College, Guilford Community College, and Alamance. And students get admitted to both institutions. And you, if you're an Alamance Community College student, you can go spend time at, at UNC Greensboro, be on campus, um, go to sporting events, kind of get your, get, learn your way around. And then so then when you go back to take your classes full time, um, you know, it's not such a new experience. So um, I think the guided pathways work is, is really impressive. I think ASAP's kind of a souped up version of the guided pathway, um, but that's that's what I would say we should put our money on. Okay, guided pathways. Yeah. Others? Are we going in order? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is true. It's, it's harder to figure out what the answer is. You know, I, I think a lot about um, what would it look like if we put the student first, if we address what does a student need and how do we better articulate the return on investment that we ultimately all get from it. Is it it's hard to me, I, so I get to the point of, are we framing our goal well? We often refer, then focus on what's efficient and what's efficient isn't always effective. And education is a human enterprise. So I'm framing, sorry, but I will get to your answer. With, but, <laughs> but you know, part of, uh, it does matter how we frame this, right? Just like free college sounds great, educating all sounds great. Um, and how do we ultimately get there? So I think about um, if you put the student first, what does the education look like? And how do we talk about it a way to buy ourselves more money to do it well by the students we're trying to do right by? That benefit us ultimately, it's not just about the benefit to them. And I do think that that matters. And if we frame that well, we can get to some of it. So what are the kinds of things that I think, um, if I had to pick one, because I do, live and breathe in DC and I am a recovering civil servant. I did work in the federal government. Um, you know, uh, we all want that, that silver bullet. And I think mine is a little bit of a, I do think it ultimately becomes an issue of alignment. If we're putting students first, what does, I think guided pathways is one approach to that. What we've seen ultimately, um, and holds a lot of promise, but it's a combination. I do think it is how we use the data with the students we have. Part of my challenge, and you know, my organization honored ASAP for doing a really good job. Um, it forces students to be traditional. Mm. It forces them to be traditional to get the benefits that we know happen with the research we've done in traditional path, in traditional ways. That's not a bad thing. But what about all those other students that aren't quite able to do that in the traditional path? They go full time, 15 credits. And you know, we have a lot of great uh, campaigns you know, um, to try and get there. I do think that um, institutional change that puts student first and figures that out is, has to be authentic. So it's not a silver bullet. But again, now the public policy hat. I do think that um, tracking the student that they can be what they do is portable, what they do uh, is something that stays with them so they can get to and through and complete. Um, whether it's credits, uh, an experience, is something we need to value more, like competency-based education and others. There are ways we put together the reality of a higher education approach to individuals. We've got a lot of tools out there, but we look at them disparately. So I think the alignment of those Efforts, you know, prior uh, prior learning assessments, uh, CBEs, all those things. Community colleges are doing them in disparate ways. They're not necessarily aligned. Sometimes it's because they're having to chase resources to do them. So I do think we have lots of tools in our in our toy chest. I think the alignment of them to pull them out as students need is what we need to be doing a better job of. Okay. So we have two answers that are about alignment, and interestingly enough don't necessarily involve a lot more money. Right. Interesting. Two very practical um, perspectives. Let me open it though to Josh and, and David. What if we did have more money? 
I mean, I have an answer that involves more money. Okay, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, if we had more money, if we were in that, that world. So, I mean, I, I think that um, solutions like guided pathways and alignment and developing leaders and getting the right people in place that can implement policies like ASAP is a very important piece of success in any organization. But I think also if you're maybe more focused on policy like, like I am, I would think about what are the policy levers we can pull that don't rely on finding a change agent within an organization or finding exceptional talent. That's something we can just do as a policymaker. And so one idea, um, not the only idea, but one idea is um, uh, a brief that I wrote for the Hamilton Project about a year ago now called um, Increasing College Completion with a Federal Matching Grant. And the idea behind it is that for largely um, idiosyncratic reasons, higher ed funding from the state operates very differently than higher ed funding from the federal government. In particular, the state tends to fund higher education on the supply side, meaning on the institution side. So universities get big appropriations mm -hmm. block grants, essentially. Sometimes they're targeted, but they're grants directly to public institutions from state taxpayers. And the federal government subsidizes student, at the student levels so on the demand side by giving grants like Pell Grants, Stafford Loans, things like that. So the federal government does not subsidize institutions, it subsidizes students, and that money follows the student wherever they go. And what's happened over time is for a variety of political reasons, states' budgets have been really tight, in part because states can't run a deficit, they've mostly balanced their budgets, and so when they have lean years, they have to cut somewhere, and healthcare is often an entitlement, and so what's the biggest discretionary item in states' budgets? It's higher ed, and so, you know, state budgets fluctuate kind of wildly and they're always under pressure for higher ed. And so on the spending side, you're getting a lot of fluctuation and a kind of steady downward trend. And then the federal government is kicking in more and more and more money to subsidize higher ed on the, on the demand side, on the price side. And so, you, you know, Pell Grant's getting more generous, Stafford loans are getting more generous, and state funding is going down. So my worry with a lot of things that happen is you cut, um, you have these state level initiatives to make college free, and then the states say, great, we can disinvest. Right, because, and so you get less money coming in and essentially you make it free by spending less per student than you previously did. And so one way to try to counteract that is for the federal government to reverse the trend of only investing on the student side and to give essentially a matching grant the way Medicaid works in many states where for every dollar the state spends on higher ed, the federal government kicks in another dollar or another two dollars or whatever you want it to work out. And so that way, you, and you could calibrate a policy like that so that any free college plan, if a state wanted to implement that, would be spending neutral from the perspective of the students. So you get more students, but the per student allocation of money would stay the same or something like that. And so essentially you're giving states an incentive not to disinvest like they have for policies like Medicaid. Actually, it's kind of the opposite for higher ed now because for um, when states uh, raise their tuition, they know that the Pell Grant's gonna kick in and counteract some of that, and so they actually have a disincentive to invest in higher ed now. So kind of reversing that downward trend, I think would do something, especially if you think that spending matters, it, which I think it does, it would do something to try to arrest this decline at the state level. So that's one idea. Okay, Josh. So, um, you know, when I go to colleges, so, so I don't come from a policy lens or with, with a particular um, idea of how to fix a problem. I think in any policy, class or anytime you're ex examining a problem, you've got to ask what the problem is, right? What's the major problem? So the prior study from MDRC prior to ASAP was on, one of them was on learning communities, random assignment. At Kingsborough Community College worked great, mm -hmm. and in three other colleges didn't work at all, and in one it was sort of moderate. But it was great at Kingsborough. Mm -hmm. And what was the difference? Leadership. It was the culture of the institution and the capacity of the institution to do the work. And, and David, I would actually argue that we don't even know whether we can affect culture because we've never made an investment in higher ed, in human capital and leadership at a national level. And I think relatively few states have actually gone at this. So what are the problems? I mean, it's remarkable. In K-12, we talk about the quality of instructors and the quality of principals. And we, you know, the Broad Foundation put a big investment in superintendents, right? And what are we doing in higher ed? It's as though the human beings don't matter. And so I think the relative investment that should be made, we can talk about where it comes from, I'm not sure it's a federal investment, ought to be in leadership. So what are the problems? Well, the problem starts actually at the board level. If you look at how, you know, 75% of all students are in public institutions. Um, all, almost all community colleges are public. How are the boards, they're either elected or they're appointed. And often those appointments come from the same people who are appointing people for the Public Service Commission. It's the boards and commissions entity at the state level that's deciding who those appoint. And, and they're not trained at all. So problem one, we haven't thought about the boards at all. Number two, boards hire presidents. Many board members are alumni and they have a very nostalgic view of higher ed. The nostalgic view of higher ed is if we can market and get our enrollments up, we're great. 
bodies and buildings. That's what defines quality. Well, that's not what we need today. We need focus on student success. They don't understand how to hire. We need training on how to hire presidents who can do the work. And then we need leadership development programs. We need a, a, a state by state and national investment, both, both saying this matters and investing in it. Um, there are only 1,000 community college presidents in this country. I can count to 1,000. There are 10 million community college students. I can't count that high. What are we doing to invest in these folks? And if we're going to see ASAP, and, and I've been involved in the Guided Pathways movement. I completely agree with you, Andrew, that that is a very promising movement. But I've worked now as part of a group that's worked with 30 colleges. And I've seen the data on implementation. Mm -hmm. And it works in some places, and it's not working in others. Mm -hmm. And the difference is leadership. And so I think we've got to think about an investment in leadership that states ought to put money behind leadership development through the institutions, but particularly at the presidential level. And, and um, I would say it's even more important in higher ed than K-12, because at the K-12 level, at least you have superintendents who can set policy and boards that set policy. Each institution, each of the 1,000 plus community colleges decides on its own curriculum pretty much on its own. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're even more independent. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen great institutions where leaders are able to move the culture of the institution, dramatically improve outcomes. We see this in the Aspen Prize. And it is always, always a huge component is the culture and leadership of the organization, which can be impacted. We know ways it can be impacted through HR systems, through data use systems, through, through a, a bunch of things that can be done at the institutional level. But we need people who ascend to the presidency and are chosen for it who really have the capacity to do that work and the commitment to do that work. So that's where I would invest. And we can talk about who ought to do the investing. Um, I don't think it's the federal government, uh, which is why I don't think free college is the way at the biggest problem that we face. OK, we, we're going to come back to funding issue in, in, a, in a moment. Um, but we keep talking around this question about scale. Um, and whether it's done from the top down or the bottom up, we do have some examples where great leadership or ASAP or guided pathways work at one institution. Mm -hmm. But isn't this a problem of scale? We're talking about millions and millions of students. How do we take something that we find works in one state or one institution or one leader and spread that more broadly. I mean, that's, I uh, the first one was a softball. Now I'm, you know, the, I'm in it. You know, isn't yeah. that like the three trillion dollar question? Like, what's the what's the entire education budget in the United States? Right. I mean, it's like it's that's the that's the whole enchilada that Deborah said. Um, uh, how do we take it to scale? Well, I, I do want to make one thing clear, which is I think I do think guided pathways need not be you know, super expensive, right? Need not be as expensive as say a free a free college program. But there is investment necessary, right? Because the guy it's the guided piece I think that's most important. There is is not just laying out the pathways, but actually having the intrusive advising, um, you know, uh, sort of kick in and have and, and nudge people back in onto the path. Some of that you can automate, um, you know, and 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 but 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 a lot of it has to be a human being picking up the phone or, uh, or or being you know being available to answer questions. In terms of scale, I mean, I, you know, I don't I don't think I have a, a great answer to it. Unfortunately, I think. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with leadership, as, as Josh pointed out. You know, this is why I'm skeptical of the federal involvement in terms of, like, a federal matching grant is interesting to me, but I think a couple, I, I do think it's different from Medicaid and that Medicaid's means tested, right? So, so, so only certain people can get can get Medicaid services, whereas a so block make grant the matching grant means tested for colleges that serve high shares of poor students. You could, I mean, you could do, you could base it on the institution's share, sure, yeah. So that would be, I mean, that's one one way you could do it. But I do think that you know the federal involvement, say in K twelve, right, with the school improvement grants, I mean, it has been sort of a morass, right? It has not been successful for by most by most measures. Some people have found, you know, local effects on on some of the some of the, the schools that have been part of it. Um, I think it's more of I, I tend to be a little bit biased on this now, but uh, I think it's a more of a state a state issue um, to focus on. Josh is right on the community college side. Uh, we have a system in North Carolina of 58 community colleges with 800 trustees who are in charge. Mm -hmm. 800, 800 trustees on these 58 boards of trustees, and so there's just no. I mean, it, how do you how do you implement something at the in the North Carolina community college system? It's very, it's, it's difficult, if not if not impossible, especially with fidelity. Um, so I mean, color me a skeptic. I do think a lot of this is putting the right people in the right place, giving them the resources. So it's a combination of those two things. Um, but but it's 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 hard. It's, it's there's no 
answer about how to scale. I, I, I just have two thoughts about scale. One is we've got to get better data reports that are standardized to the college leadership. A lot of people think that colleges don't want the information. We often think about the information about graduation rates and, in, and, and what students earn after graduation as going directly to the consumer. I'm not terribly convinced that that's going to make a big difference. I think colleges are the mm -hmm. consumers of that information. And leadership wants the information, mm -hmm. and we need to get it to them. This ban on the student unit record system, your boss tried to fight that, the good fight, a decade ago. And um, the ban on the student unit record system is just, it's indefensible. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there are plenty of ways of protecting privacy. The ban on trying to connect to what actually happens to students as, as a group in terms of what the outcomes are indefensible. So I think we need much better data that with the target of being college leadership that can start to end programs that don't have strong value at the back end and modify those that can be modified and beef up the ones where there's good out, where there are good outcomes. So I think one for scale that would help. The second is I, I want to just give a shout out to actually the American Association of Community Colleges has done this work on guided pathways where they bring for two years multiple times teams of individuals, leaders from the institution who work through creating the clear guided pathways, who work through how to modify the advising system. And each of them learns what the research says, but then has time away from campus to actually think through what their plans and how they're going to um, adopt those reforms themselves. I think more investments where you, where you invest in the individuals, you push them and say, you've got to come up with plans towards this end actually has seen some pretty good results. The Community College Research Center at Columbia at Teachers College has done research and, and we're seeing pretty good results from that. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of scale, we need to start thinking about not, here's the technical solution and the research, throw it against the wall and it's gonna be adopted. It doesn't work that way, but actually bringing teams from colleges to convenings with tasks to do and then bringing them back together um, to hold each other accountable and to support one another in the work. I think it actually can work. I think the University Innovation Alliance is proving that in some ways. Uh, the American Talents Initiative, which Harvard is part of, we're starting that work to try to increase for, for four-year colleges um, the number of, of low-income students that they're enrolling and retaining. So I actually think uh, groups of colleges that start stop seeing each other solely as competitors and start seeing each other as a collection of institutions designed to achieve a public good and to support one another through that process could actually be a way to scale. But it's going to require an infrastructure that is decentralized. I think the state is a great way to do it. Okay. But you're talking about a number of things that re revolve around a lot of people time. Mm -hmm. So whether it's them working together differently, working in mm -hmm. teams, using data. Um, and a question that I received ahead of time from colleagues over at Bunker Hill Community College, if you think a bit about the faculty. So in K through 12, we talk a lot about what are we gonna do with the teachers? We're gonna train the teachers, support the teachers, but we don't really do that in higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this colleague described, you know, you have community college faculty have workloads of five sections per semester. They have these high workloads. Uh, how are, given the fact that they're already strapped for their time, how are they going to learn to do things differently? How are we going to support them, um, knowing that we have many faculty out there who care deeply about their students, but don't have a lot of free time to think about new plans? How do we scale things beyond, you know, some of the early adopters who are investing in this? So I think we should take a, a lesson from Valencia College, where they have a tenure system um, that's five years long, and every faculty member at the beginning of their tenure process has to decide what teaching practice they want to get better at. Um, they have a definition of what a great teacher is, and their tenure process is designed to do action research in the classroom and get better at what you do, supported by a really good teaching and learning center. And so I think I completely agree that we leave faculty out of the equation, uh, but if you go onto the campus of Valencia and you ask folks, how do you know if students are learning? Nobody says, I know because I'm giving them grades. They've all come through a system that rewards them for attempting new things, for trying new methods of teaching beyond the lecture, um, that really, really works and has them engaged. And that extends over to redesigning advising systems and all the other things that need to be done, creating guided pathways. So I think, I think we've got to ask ourselves that second part of the question on human capital, which is how do we engage faculty, not just in completion, but in teaching and learning, in excellence in teaching and learning? How do we do that authentically on a college campus so that faculty don't feel as though they're an afterthought or we're asking them to dumb down 
what they do. Um, and again, I think that's a question of leadership and culture, but it can be created, and I think we can teach the ability to do that. And Valencia, if you haven't been, I, across higher ed, I have not seen a better system uh, structure for getting faculty to understand um, what it is that's expected of them and to feel authentically engaged and really enjoy it. This is not top down. This is, I love to try new things in the classroom. I can give you just fantastic examples that have spread across the campus. Um, so, so to me, I would go right to classroom teaching practice and engagement with faculty on how to make that better. Yeah, I, I think part of the challenge of the, the scaling piece um, is that uh, there is a lot of resistance because we've, the way we've always done things is the way we should do things. And you know, the people that need to adapt are the students. The students need to change, right? And, and I, the challenge of scaling is that we're not a unified system. Higher ed is purposely diverse and decentralized and uh, with all the trustees and all those things going on. You know, I think part of what we have to do is uh, bring together the coalition of the willing and have them be the trendsetters that are going to fundamentally address who our students are in community colleges, which is not often how we in public policy perceive them to be because we have a antiquated view, even our data, you know, to your lag because you've got to break things through iPads and such and so, um, and, and change is happening faster than that. I do think that um, faculty, and, and we do a lot of work with institutions on the ground, uh, administrators on the ground, uh, select. Um, they see what's happening day in and day out and we don't often talk to them about that. I know I'm in DC and you know, we have these great esoteric conversations. Um, we're gonna solve it ourselves. And at scale, you lose the face of the student while you're doing it, because you have to address that. I mean, you know, what's 100,000 students when you're trying to serve 3 million, um, 4 million, 17 million, 18 million. So I do think um, our strategy has been like, let's work with this coalition of the willing. We can spend all of our time trying to convince people that this one silver bullet is the silver bullet. Um, and in the process, we, there's a lot of carnage in between, including students who are in the system right now and not getting it. Uh, but then um, investing in and supporting the coalition of the willing who are willing to try and pilot and make sure that the students are addressed. I think that's, it seems trite, but it's, it's not. I mean, because there is no silver bullet, right? What's authentic to one institution, Valencia, we work with them, great. They struggle sometimes at the University of Central Florida, um, but then they work together and it's magical for lots of students, but not all students. And I don't think, you know, I struggled with what's the one answer that we could do across a system that's so diversified. I don't think we have that. What we don't have is momentum to do something different for the students we have today other than trying all kinds of big scale efficiency things. And I know that's horrible to say, I also study economics, but you know, um, the, the challenge of the uh, human enterprise of what we're trying to come across is really challenging. Okay. Can I say well, just one thing about the teaching piece? Sure. Because I think it's um, so important. Um, it's, we, we sort of treat it as a total black box and, and, and <laughs> for lots of reasons, right? Um, reasons that people you know who have offices in this building appreciate <laughs> right <laughs> academic freedom and, and all that right there's there's not a, there's not a whole lot of attention to teaching quality as and I know that I did I, I took a you know probably like a one credit course when I was a grad student on how to teach undergraduates you know um, wasn't wasn't particularly effective uh, uh, so <laughs> no offense uh, it wasn't designed to be uh, frankly so um, a, a plug though for anybody out there who's working on a dissertation right I'm sure there's somebody out there look at at teaching effects in higher education. There's almost nothing on it. That's true. You know, David Figlio and colleagues did something on adjuncts, I think, at Northwestern. Yeah. And Matt Chingos. Eric and I did as well. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. And, Ohio. And, uh, Matt Chingos um, did a piece on community colleges where I actually found a set of community college faculty that, and the course had a standard exam, right, which is often what we're missing. The K-12 people have those wonderful standardized tests where they can just kind of evaluate, value at it over and over and over again. But a plug, please look at it. Even just basic, you know, does teaching experience matter? Do credentials matter? Like all the questions that they answered 20 years ago in K-12, you know, I think are unanswered for us. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So inside the classroom, definitely being very important. Lots of work that could be there, uh, be done there. Um, but many of the solutions that you propose had to do with academic pathways, what's happening in the classroom, academic leadership, um, but 
as Deborah Burr said, we know that community college students are very diverse. They're coming from lots of different backgrounds. They have lots of different challenges, assets, competing demands, as I said earlier. Um, and so some, of, some people have put forth that what we really need to do is focus on some of the non-academic, whether that is food insecurity, stress, trauma, childcare, parking. How do you guys think about that relative to some of the more academic proposals and trying to improve outcomes? Should community colleges be engaging in these broader sense of concerns? I, I'll just a quick stab at it. Yes, and they are. Um, I think that if you look at guided pathways, the second part of it is to try to identify when students fall off the pathway and then figure out why and get them back on. Sometimes that's because of academic challenges they have, and sometimes it's because of non-academic challenges. And a lot of colleges are, are moving towards a case management approach. You want to talk where, about where an investment needs to be made. You know, the 500 to 1 mm -hmm. advisor to student ratio does not work if you want a case management approach. You've got to get it down to 150 or, or 175 or even, even lower. But it's really trying to meet every student where they are. And sometimes it's as simple as my car broke down and um, you know, there are emergency loans available to students or emergency grants available to students. Sometimes there's food insecurity. And sometimes it is I don't really get the material and I don't have time to go to the tutoring center. So you have to deal with the academic side of that. But I do think that recognizing um, all that we know, and, and thanks to Sarah Goldrick Rabb, we know a lot more about the number of students who are in hunger. She's a professor at Temple now, mm -hmm. who's done terrific work on, on, on surveying students. And, and it's shown that we have food insecurity is a big problem on community college campuses. And uh, it's got to be dealt with. Um, I think the assumption that when we see students struggling, that we know the problem, that it's, you know, number one, you can just say to them, go to the tutoring center. Well, number one, Students don't do optional. They're not going to show up at the tutoring center if they've got a job to go to. We're going to have to figure out some ways of building that into the classroom and making it easier for them. And number two, we shouldn't assume we know what the problem is unless we really ask them and, and come up with solutions that, that address what they're doing. So I think this is what the advising reform that's part of Guided Pathways is all about, which is trying to figure out a range of academic and non-academic uh, um, uh, supports for students. But Josh, it based could on be partnering with community based organizations. It doesn't have to be the institution itself, right? That's right. So, uh, like community colleges work, have a service area, and that's one thing they do very well. They know who they're serving because it's limited. They're not trying to compete with the selectives in significant ways. So, but there are community based organizations that know that community better, so the institution doesn't have to do it all themselves. Terrific. And point. I do think that that makes a lot of sense too. What's, what's feasible, what's doable for an institution in taking all of this on? So, so I, I've heard um, we need better leadership, we need better teaching quality, we need more wraparound services to deal with students who have food insecurity and other serious issues, guided pathways, a lot of different things. What I don't hear in this is any idea that that will scale because every college needs something slightly different and that's all contextual and local. The only thing that will fix all of those problems at once is more resources. And so I can't believe I'm saying this as a card-carrying economist, but uh, <laughs> It, all this discussion of how community colleges can do better with what they have feels second order relative to the fact that we have a goal of trying to get many, many, many more people to complete a much higher quality education than they currently have. And we just need, we need to spend more money on it if it's a societal priority. So I'm not saying that these things don't matter. They matter a lot. But it, it does sort of feel like um, uh, we're, we're sort of... Um, giving the game away by saying we have to work with a fixed budget. I'm not, no one here is saying that, but I think it's important right. to say that um, any real effort at increasing completion goals or make, making you know, access to higher education truly different than what it is today has to be about a bargain where one side of the bargain is getting more to work with and the other side is how do you make yourself more efficient. But there's no evidence of, uh, that, that colleges with more money do better on some of these other metrics. I agree with you, we need to I, invest more in higher I don't think that's true. I think higher Go ahead, David. Well, yeah. what's, Go ahead. what's the evidence? So, I mean, I have a recent paper with Chris Walters uh, where we show this. Um, I don't want to get into all the gory details. Well, this was your ticket onto the panel, so. Yeah, the whole, <laughs> whole reason I'm here. I guess so at least I know one person w believes it. He did not share this paper before. At least, at least one debate, person debate, believes debate. the work. Yeah. So, uh, no, and there's other studies. I mean, if you think about, okay, what is the evidence that spending matters for higher education? It's really not just our paper. I think that the ASAP program is actually 
evidence that spending matters. You spend more money to complete a degree. And when you look at what ASAP is doing, it's not some special formula that no one's ever tried before. It's the things that Harvard College does for their undergrads. Lots of, mm -hmm. stu lot of support for students, lots of adult time, paying attention to a variety of student needs. You all know that when you and your colleagues were an undergrad, it wasn't just about academic support. It was everything else in your life. And so we know what works. We spend more money on giving student a more, students a more guided experience, and they complete at higher rates. And so I think I don't, I don't really think we're in this world where we have no idea how to do it. I think we have a world where we don't have enough to do it with. And so. Uh, and then do we have the will to invest in this population course. that's a community college? Course, this is the yeah. question. Where will the funding come from? Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, I'm not trying to say that none of these, that these, pop, that these <laughs> efficiency improvements are like ways of making, I'm not trying to say those don't matter. They matter a lot. I just, I don't think that if you only, I think if we did all these things that we all want to do, we could get the completion rate up from 40 to 50%. But we're not going to get it to 80 or 90%. You know, if you look at the history of US uh, educational attainment, how do we get to be a world leader in the 20th century? It was with mass secondary education. We were the first country in the world to make high school almost universally available, as opposed to a more elite track systems in Europe where the pipeline narrows a lot. And we did that by funding it at the local level in a very decentralized way. It wasn't federal bureaucrats saying, this is what a high school looks like. It was That's local right. communities perceiving a need to educate people so they could work in factories that were local. And so we levied local property taxes to fund local schools. And to me, that's a story morally about resources than it is about finding some secret sauce and propagating it all across the country. So, so where is the money going to come from? <laughs> well, I, you know. I'm so glad to be moderator and not one of the people. Yeah. Well, I don't have to actually give answers. So, so uh, one, one thing that I do want to pick up on what, Dave, what David said is, you know, th there's a notion that, that you know, you, I, you're, and you, you're, you didn't say this exactly, but I, I heard it, which is more resources means more spending, right? Yeah. More public spending. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there, the, the, uh, you could argue, right, that in the case of, say, California community colleges, that they should raise their tuition, right? I mean, their tuition is very low. Yeah. Covered by a Pell Grant. That's one way to get more resources for an institution. To right, but it, but it's not but it's not something we often talk about, right? Because we're because the because the free college conversation yeah. has been so right has been so sort of a you know uh, prominent, let's say. So you know just but like you know listen listen you know play it out, right? You know you got a nurse you got nursing programs, right? Where the return to becoming a registered nurse is 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 quite high, right? You got enormous wait lists to get into nursing programs in community colleges, and often in four years sometimes. Part of the reason you have that is because the tuition is so low that you cannot afford to enroll a nut, the, margin, the, the student on the margin, right? You can't, you, you can't cover the cost of educating them, yeah. right? So the question then is, is the right, is the right conversation a mix of, of you know, public and private resources? Whether the private resources yeah. come from students or from hospital systems or from other yeah. places, right? Somebody, but, somebody's paying. You know, it's the taxpayer or the student yeah. or the and you hospital. Didn't, but, but, but resources typically in this conversation only has one, is essentially me, means state or federal investment, right? And I, again, I don't think you were yeah. saying that specifically, but yeah. I do think it's important to clarify, to clarify that. Yeah. And, and so I, and I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. So, so I want to come back to this point. I think that if you add investment, you're going to replicate what we're getting and you're going to get more of it, which is a good thing. But I don't know that you're going to change the mix of what needs to happen. Mm. And so, so, so to me, it's not clear that an increased investment is going to change the mix of outcomes. We just may get more of the same mix, which would be good. And that's why I support a public investment. And to this point, where's the money going to come from within the institution? So um, at the same time you're, you're increasing the nursing program, why are you offering as many slots, if any, in things like massage therapy and culinary arts and some of the things where we actually don't see great outcomes. Why are you offering general education associates degrees without a clear pathway to a four-year degree? Maybe you should put more resources there. I actually think within institutions, if we change the incentive structure and the information available to them, there is actually a change in the mix within institutions that also would be needed. And the question is, who's going to do that? Who's going to incentivize? or lead the institution to change that mix. I think public policy can do away with some of the low, so the really poor performing programs. And we've seen some states like Kentucky say, if it's not a high wage, high demand field, we're not going to approve a new program. So I think states can start to say, 
And that's not to say we don't care about history, right? Well, like they did tricky, in Florida. Right? That's, that's it is tricky. Because it's, it's, a high wage program is a high, that means high private benefits to the person going, not necessarily high social benefits. There are a lot of programs that you want to support right. because they have social value even if the wage returns are not very mm -hmm. high. Like, so you can make that decision. Yeah. So you can make yeah. that decision, right? I mean, whatever you want to say is the value that we want to invest in. Right. But I don't think anybody thinks that more massage therapists who are unemployed or earning minimum wage is necessarily going to help our society. So forgive me yeah, for all of those who are but getting massages after that's this. That's not even the core of this. I mean, we can you can get rid of those things potentially or put it in the private market, but this is about community colleges who have a high concentration of low income first generation students who see it as an access point, who get have fundamentally less resources than all these others and our expectation is that these students that have more need than others are in institutions that have less resources than others and we expect that they are going to do as well or better with less money and I so I do think that uh, we're setting ourselves up for failure here and ultimately we blame the students for not being successful when we set it up in a no-win situation so the opportunity to say okay if we know these things work at at Harvard um, can we implement them? Are they going to work um, the same way we, you know, uh, like degree plans? I mean, I, I know my first semester, I knew what I was going to do for my first, my, my complete four years. And I finished in four years. But how often do you see that at community college? And how often are we doing the things we know work in those places? And, and it's not efficient. I mean, we have students who, uh, you know, don't even finish and have 90 credits trying to transfer to a yep. four-year. So I do think, I do agree that there are some efficiency things. I think the challenge of the resources is the expectation that we're going to see more by investing less in these institutions and these students. And I think that's a fundamental challenge we face in public policy. We're yeah. not getting that right, and, um, and then we're looking at outcomes expecting the same. So if I were to summarize some of uh, the solutions you're putting forth, some are community colleges know what they need to do, but the faculty workload is such that and the, the advisor to student ratio is so high that if we were to drop, a, you know, 100 people on every campus, things would improve because we know what needs to be done and we just need more people to provide it. On the other hand, I'm also hearing we need to do some things that are radically different. We need to learn about new practices and, and change the way that we're doing things. And so that's kind of what I'm hearing on both sides. And those things can both be true at the same time. I yeah. think so. Yes. Yeah. And can I yeah. just an addendum? Because yeah. I hope you didn't think you're going to put that list out there without an addendum. But um, <laughs> <laughs> dro dro dropping 100 people in, right, and, and, and potentially, again, back to this question about are they new resources or do you reallocate, right. potentially moving out some people from the organization who are not mm delivering value effectively, right? So some of this is that we layer, right? I mean, vendor, I know this for a fact, vendors call every single department that they can get their hands on, right? With a new solution, right? For whether it's data and analytics or whatever. And then everybody implements it, but nothing ever changes, nothing ever goes away, right? Whoever the old, you know, the IR shop still exists. And so there's, a, there's sort of a layering approach, which I think is actually, you know, sort of what, some of what you were saying, which is just, you know, just, just scaling, just scaling every you know best practice is kind of a recipe for more of this layering. So, mm -hmm. I do think it's about 100 people dropping in, but we also need to take a look at who that are they replacing 50 or okay. 25. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask uh, the panel one more question, and then I want to open it up for the audience to ask questions as well. Uh, so we have talked a, a bunch about what's the federal government going to do or what community colleges can do. Andrew, you started to kind of allude to where I want to go with this question is, which is what about the private sector? Or what about the four-year institutions? Or what about the high schools? The other players around community colleges, do they have some responsibility here and could they help with, with these problems? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, this is the challenge of this kind of conversation is it, uh, we want to push a silver bullet because we're public policy, but it's, it's the, but the point about alignment is that it, it's not just any one entity. And it's not just faculty, although it is faculty. It's not just leadership, although it is leadership. It's about having good data, but it's not just about good data. So, you know, the private role is significant um, in some simple ways. They are also consumers of the products created through the colleges. So, uh, you know, they can demand and they can invest in the enterprise that is community college to get the students, the workers that they need. Um, 
but they need to be included and seen as partners in that effort. And we're seeing good community colleges are doing that. I mean, I think some of the stuff you've seen in the Aspen Prize, that's clear, some of the institutions we work with, um, that rather than thinking uh, that the employers need to be out of the space um, because the integrity and the how solemn our academic experience must be, um, bringing them in creates a, a dynamism that engages students as well as institutions. So I do think there is a core uh, private role um, I do think it needs to be done with clarity and partnership and that um, and there is useful tension in that process. So I, um, I think all of those outside entities matter for community colleges for K-12, four-year colleges, employers and community-based organizations and in our fellowship program um, with, with the school on the West Coast that I don't want to mention here, uh, maybe a rival, uh, that we the run with them. Yes. Hangs out with you a lot. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, that we do with My Stanford. Partner. Uh, we teach internal change management and we teach this notion of strategic partnership. Let me just mention on the K-12 side. So right now, there are nine or 10 million students in community college, something like six million are degree seeking or are taking credit classes. A million of those students, we think, are high school students mm -hmm. engaged in dual enrollment. It's 15%, maybe 20% in, in, in many places. It's enormous. And one thing we really don't know very well is whether the four kinds of advanced coursework that are available to high school students, meaning AP, IB, early college high school, which is sort of a different model, and then dual enrollment, which is probably you know, rivaling at this point AP. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's huge. We really don't know what the outcomes are. And so I think K-12 needs to get in the game here and say, what are we doing to connect all of those opportunities to guided pathways, if that's where the movement is. What are we doing to actually help students learn the math they need for their degree programs, instead of assuming that everybody should be on the calculus track? I think there's a whole bunch of things that K-12 can get in the game, and we've seen great examples where you see really good alignment between K-12 expectations and college expectations, not just for entry, but for programs of study that yield great results for students. But it requires that K-12 starts to think itself of itself as well as responsible in the way the KIPP schools have, as responsible for college attainment and beyond, and, and own that in partnership with colleges. There are terrific examples, but I think just as we need colleges to raise their sights to post-graduation success, we need K-12 to, to really uh, double down on college and career ready in real ways in partnership with community colleges. So I think it can be done. And, it's hugely important. Okay. I'll just say quickly, one of the things we've done in North Carolina is we've, for, on the four-year side, is we have you know, signed every one of our 16 four-year institutions onto what we're calling a performance agreement. And they have to aim for particular goals, right, on particular measures, right? One of the measures we use is a measure called undergraduate degree efficiency, degrees produced per 100 full-time equivalent students, right? Mm -hmm. You do much better on that measure if you enroll transfer students, because they're only there for half the time, but you get credit for the full degree, right? So suddenly our institutions are scrambling around to say, gosh, we should develop more transfer pathways, right? Because it's going to help us do better on that measure. We actually, you know, and, and we actually, it also helps us in our local communities and so on. There's other reasons to do it, right? But, but you have to, like, right now, obviously, the, the federal graduation rate says forget about transfer students. Don't pay any attention to them. They don't count. Don't worry about it. If you want to rise on that measure, you know, actually pay less attention to them, right? Because they just dilute the resources for your first time full time students. So you got to kind of change the way you measure uh, and what you, what you measure and what you value as well, like at, at the system or state level uh, to encourage that. So. Okay. I'm sure they want to ask some questions. I'll hold my <laughs> comment. <laughs> okay, I want to open it up uh, for the audience. Uh, I do want to ask uh, that we do focus on questions rather than commentary um, and try to keep your questions less, to, less than 30 seconds so we can uh, try to include as many voices as possible. Thank you. Hi, hi I, uh, Jed Schwartz. I'm uh, a writer from Somerville. And, uh, and, and it seems to me that uh, maybe some of you agree that the, the question of whether tuition should be free or not has seemed to have been bypassed, perhaps, by some of the, much of this discussion. Because uh, uh, it, it seems to me that if, if the discussion were, were centered around not whether it should be free, but how to motivate community college students better, uh, then, then the question would be, well, we should lower tuition, but 
uh, make tuition rebates a possibility based upon accomplishments. I realize this is, this is a fairly far out idea, but perhaps some of you could react to it. So what do you think of this yeah. idea of, of not free up front, but re rebates if you do certain yeah. things? Or, or no, I remember when I was in the uh, Department of Ed, you know, Thank how many of you have HOPE scholarships? The original idea of free college was two years at the Clinton administration, and then we are doing tax credits in, instead. And, you know, that doesn't work for low-income people. That you have to have the money up front to then get it back later. So. Well, I'm saying you could lower the, re reduce the, 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 uh, uh, well, the, op the opposite would be you make it free and then you make people pay it back if they don't finish. That, that would be the other way to do yeah. it. I mean, that's a little more yeah. punitive. I mean, it's, yeah. it's essentially, it's, it, in principle, it's the same, but it doesn't feel the same. <laughs> Spoken like an economist. So, so we are actually <laughs> seeing. <laughs> and Texas tried to do yeah. that, actually, really? and they just didn't market it well and beyond it just didn't time. work. Yeah, yeah. the beyond yeah. time. So, yeah. so we are actually seeing some colleges and states toy with the idea of incentives to increase credit intensity. Yeah. Um, so anything over 12 credits is free. Right, the federal definition of full time is 12 credits, but at 12 credits you can't finish in two years, a two year degree, right, problem. So the point is anything over 12 credits is free so that that incentivizes people to take that extra three credits. You could think about moving from six to nine credits. I mean, I think we've gotta be very careful that students who can't go full time don't enjoy these benefits. So it could be regressive if we don't really think about making it available to others. But I do think that notion of incentives seems to work in credit intensity and people are, Trying and there's good evidence that even going full time one semester increases your graduation rates. They, they, they've been some experiments, increases your graduation rates. So I think trying to think about the incentives for behavior that doesn't punish students who are low income, who can't complete because of life circumstances, but incentivizes behavior that aligns with completion, I think is a promising area. There's a, there's okay. a paper, we have this marginal tuition, we have this sort of tuition exactly. for everything over 12 is free. There's a paper on this by Steve Hamilton, some uh, co-author, Kevin, Kevin Stein, that's right, um, that shows that it's not really, it doesn't really affect credit in uh, credit accumulation. Um, so, and I think part of that's because people have missed the fact that, you know, if you take another class, you ha you have to spend time on that class rather than work, right? So there is so there is kind of a it's not free, right? Yeah. To your point, right. It's not free. There's an opportunity There's an cost opportunity to taking the right. to taking that extra class. So I do think Indiana, for instance, has said you get extra money you get extra money on our state grant program if you take 30 credits. You can enroll at this higher rate, right? And if you do that with the 3.0, you can. You know, so so I do think that's another way to think about this is rather than just do the flat the flat pricing. I think makes sense in general, but I don't think it actually changes the behavior. Yeah. Based on the well, we should have some evidence on this. We have a ex national experiment going where we told students if you take an additional credit, you get a larger Pell Grant. Nice. Stay tuned. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Your question. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Lipson. I'm a joint MBA student and public policy student at the Business School and the Kennedy School. Um, my question is a little bit on this um, connection to good jobs question of around the community college system. Um, we've referenced a little bit about the role that community colleges play in providing mobility and economic opportunity, but also how siloed the system is and individual schools working pretty autonomously. Um, when you think about the fact that a lot of these schools are in communities where the demand just might not be there for, for higher um, jobs that require the credentials and associate's degrees um, that these schools are producing, even if the institutions themselves are doing a, a great job of uh, producing students, if there's no jobs there at the end of the day in their community, um, what's the, the next step? So I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this general like geographic mobility question. Mm -hmm. We've seen the data that less Americans are moving than ever before in the last 60, 70 years, um, particularly acute for youth. What do you think is the role of the community college can play in perhaps fostering um, sharing of information about where there is economic opportunities so that a student who completes can actually go somewhere where they can really realize the return to that degree or credential and see in a subsequent increase in wages and opportunity for them? So, That's a really good question. So yeah, I think for the majority of community colleges, changing the mix will improve things, but for some it's hard. So I actually think the degree of difficulty in rural places that are frankly struggling to attract employers and when they do their call centers where they're minimum wage jobs, which I don't think community colleges by and large should be uh, educating people for, it's a really hard question. And, and leaders in these institutions, they're called community colleges for a reason. They view themselves as community leaders and as 
uh, deliverers of education for students. And it's really hard to say, we're gonna help people get credentials so that they can go to the big city and get a job, mm -hmm. right? That's not an adequate answer for them. The best example, I think the degree, the best example I've seen of this is Walla Walla Community College in, uh, in uh, Eastern Washington State, where in 1999 it was a dying community. And in essence, the, the president, who was a labor economist, um, actually looked ahead and made some big bets. They made a big bet on nursing, and they convinced the state to invest hugely in nursing, mm -hmm. and they now are a regional supply of nurses. They made a big bet on winemaking. Mm. And they saw, they talked to the local employers. So it wasn't just looking at data, it was talking to people. And they went from seven to 250 vineyards. They now bring in $2 million a weekend on wine weekends. It's a town of 20,000 people. Unemployment rates come way down. They made a big bet on wind energy. Um, because they saw, and on water management in agriculture. So they looked ahead and tried to make some bets, some based on data and some based on a vision. And now Walla Walla is a thriving community, whereas in 99, in the wake of NAFTA passing, where agriculture, high value agricultural production was drying up, they were really struggling as a community. And so I do think that in, at their best, community colleges can with employers really as part of the community be part of revitalizing a community. That is easier said than done. I've only seen it in a couple of places. Um, uh, but, but I think when you don't have the jobs as an educational institution, if you start to think of yourself as a talent developer, right? if you have talent, you can build businesses around talent. It's a different way of thinking about things. Um, it's hard sequentially. You're gonna build the program and the jobs aren't there yet, right? How do you decide which to do first? You gotta get businesses on board and you've gotta get some investment at the front end. It really worked in Walla Walla and it's a case study that I think a lot of rural community colleges could take lessons from. But it's a really hard question that for most presidents that I talk to who are in that situation, I don't, I don't know how to answer. In, in, in long run perspective, it is surely true. Why is Ann Arbor a town that has any economic activity? Why is Ithaca that way? Mm -hmm. Why are many towns the way that Chapel Hill? I mean, Chapel Hill, right? All these places <laughs> at some point had a college in them and now and eventually became thriving economies. And like that can't be an accident. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about I flipped the question around, which is basically, you know, the answer is the colleges may actually it may be the role of colleges in developing talent that's causing the <laughs> employers to come rather than employers you know, coming to the colleges yeah. may actually be, certainly in longer run historical perspective, the and way it's one, one thing to just, to just add on to that, you know, is, is um, it's, it, it, what jo the point that Josh made about, you know, our job is to train folks who go off to the big city, that is like, that is the North Carolina story in a nutshell, right? The, the rural counties, what we call tier one counties, are hemorrhaging people. They're all leaving. They're all going to the research triangle, Charlotte and the triad. And politically, that has made higher ed actually vulnerable. Right, because the voters that have to vote for bond initiatives and for legislators who fund the system say, but that's the system that just hoovers up our best people, right, yeah. and takes them out of our community. So we think about this all the time. How do we convince more graduates to go back, and from our system in particular, to go back and teach and, and serve as nurses and do rural health care? Um, so, so the one thing I'd add on the other side is that we're seeing institutions, community colleges, teach more about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just the institution that's helping to drive and connect with workers, but it's educating the students to become entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. to invest in the community themselves. So I just would add that so it's not just that's about the institution. Point, yeah. A great question. Um, many examples. Please. Um, hello. My name is Josue Lavandera. I'm a student in the International Education Policy Masters here. And my question is, even if you're able as institutions to offer free college education, you still have a limited number of resources, limited uh, infrastructure, limited faculty. So there's a limited numbers of a number of students that you can serve. How do you discriminate? How do you choose who gets in, who gets left out? And how do you prevent this process from furthering the gap between okay. those who get to this point with a, a, a good education and those who get to this point with uh, serious disadvantages? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beauty and beast of community colleges is that are supposed to be open access, right? So. Uh, putting in some measures of selectivity overtly are a challenge to do. We've seen institutions do it. You know, if you don't register by a certain period, we don't think you're gonna be successful. So we make sure that there are periods. So there are things that have been done to say, if you're not following the rules, if you're not doing X, Y, and Z, then you automatically eliminate it as opposed to being overtly selective. But, um, go ahead. Yeah, in California, so I think the California story is a really good one. We saw that, um, 
there's a, California has a huge amount of continuing adult education. So my aunt, who lives, uh, Rochelle, if you're watching this, forgive me for telling your story. Um, she lives in, um, she, she goes to Santa Monica College and she takes her yoga class there. And a few years ago, they ended it and she was up in arms. I was out visiting her. How can you let them do this? Stop this from happening. It's a true California story. No, this really is, right? Yeah, is. This is and, and I said, but they had to make a choice between holding on to the, um, the, the Math 101 class that would enable students to pursue their degrees. And this other class, frankly, and they had a cap on tuition. Those are considered credit-bearing classes there so that they get the $91 per credit hour. It's crazy. They need to raise Yoga? tuition for those things. Yoga. No, no, in California. And, but it was seen as an entitlement. And so I do think that you, colleges are going to have to start making some choices. Sometimes those choices will be rational like those, although the president of Santa Barbara City College right after winning the Aspen Prize as the best community college in the country, got voted out precisely for this reason. Mm -hmm. Because the community was up in arms on her um, shutting down continuing education programs. So I think there's, a, there's a, a real challenge there. But I think the risk you mentioned is that they could cut off access for the hardest to serve students. Um, especially now that people are seeing that developmental or remedial education doesn't actually get students all the way to a degree. They could cut off access to that. And that is, I think, really dangerous. Because um, if, if the incentive is enrollment right, and completion, and you have no incentive to serve hard to serve students, it's really easy to maintain enrollment and improve completion. You just cut off the hardest right. to serve students. In fact, we've seen kind That's of the opposite. Really we've seen community colleges try to get into the four-year space mm -hmm. to right. further expand and to grow rather than cutting back too. So yeah. that, that's it's a huge risk. And I think policy systems have got to have some risk adjustment associated with them right. so that colleges get credit for working with hard to serve students and graduating the students who come least prepared and who are growing in, in numbers in our society. We need to develop that talent and colleges should be rewarded for that. OK, I really want to get these last two questions in. Yes. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming tonight. So um, I come through this lens as uh, like an aspiring entrepreneur in this space, focused on community colleges. So I'm, I'm wondering, I've heard both tonight, the need for more money and for more bodies, right? And so um, the conundrum there is that we, we're having some states do free community college, but we're not, you know, the schools are not um, hiring more people to do that. So I'm wondering, what do you see as the opportunity for you know, vendors or aspiring vendors in this space um, as you're having more bodies go to community colleges in states uh, that are doing like Tennessee and so forth. Where do you see um, the opportunity and also what is the conversation around um, personalization? Because I know for myself, we're trying to do, as you said, ASAP does something that's not new, right? I'm trying to take tech and people to do the things that we know, like nudging, creating identity, mm -hmm. you know, getting people to personalize that, that pathway for them. Um, but uh, community colleges are extremely challenging because of that funding, right? And so I'm saying, hey, you know, we can help you with this and, and potentially be less money or a lot less money than hiring someone if because you have those constraints, not because we want to automate everything, right? But how can we how can we balance that automation plus that get those peoples for you, right? Like whether it's interns like from BC that are working for me, that kind of thing. So I'm wondering what's what do you see in the landscape of opportunity for vendors as free community college expands and what do you what do you see around the language around personalization and, and the opportunity there. Hmm. I mean, I would just say, so it has nothing to do with technology, really. But I would say that one of the things I think that's lacking in the national uh, conversation is the co College Advising Corps has done an amazing job of solving a problem in, in, on a limited scale, but solving a problem that they saw, which is high counselor-student ratio in high schools. So they've placed recent college grads. It's more like a Teach for America model. It's almost like an AmeriCorps Teach for America deal. Those guys, they're all over North Carolina. Um, and what I've talked with some of the folks at, at the advising corps about is, well, what if some of those students then moved on to our institutions and instead served as kind of student success coaches, right? Like once they, because they get, they understand the, the students who are going into our system. What if they then kind of graduated from the high school and then went and sat at one of our institutions? So I do think that there's kind of a student success coach, a near peer student success coach kind of window of opportunity. It's not really necessarily a tech, uh, a tech initiative, but, but I do think that that's a one potential area that would yeah. be interesting. I think that's, I think often our responses were tied to what you could do with existing resources because a lot of community colleges don't have 
tons of research to be innovative, yeah. to do things that, because that's like a long-term investment to see that return on what you're talking about. So tech is going to change. And they're short-term oriented because they're waiting for that next infusion or with free college, they know exactly what they have. So the lot of slush fund money to try different things is a challenge. Um, I don't know if that's an answer, but I do find that the resistance is, I mean, they see the potential and they want to help their students, but uh, finding that, you've got to make the case. It's like students, low-income students, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? right? They want that guarantee, and if you can give them that. Yeah, I, I, so we just did a technology adoption workshop for 20 institutions uh, in Florida from around the country. Mm -hmm. It's part of the Gates project called the Frontier Set. And I would say two things. One is, make sure you're solving a problem that they have. Don't create a solution to a problem they don't think they have. And so I, I had one of the MOOCs calling me all the time. We have this high quality content. Great, what's the problem you're trying to solve that they have? Well, their content isn't that good. Do they know that? Do they think that? So what's the problem you're trying to solve that they have? That's number one. Number two, make sure that they have their business processes in place to use your technology well. The number that have bought technologies that they haven't set up their business processes to use is they ought to have kept them in the box and return them. Uh -huh. And all I'll say is that, especially as a startup, if you're looking for use cases that will be successful, make sure you're working with colleges that understand what they're trying to accomplish and have their business processes in shape so that the technology can actually do what it's designed to do. Those would just be two things that I would recommend. And thank just you. thank you so much. Just briefly, last question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Uh, hi, my name's Trent, uh, alumni of the Higher Ed Master's Program last year. Uh, related to the previous question, uh, what do you see as the role of online education in the community college space? Uh, for example, Governor Brown, the governor of California, just proposed $100 million going to an endeavor uh, in California to create an online community college. Speaking of money and resources, that's a lot, in my opinion. So uh, curious to hear your opinions. So. Um, I'll say something that's maybe controversial. Is this being recorded? Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, you ask now? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would call myself an online skeptic when it comes to higher ed. And the reason I'm a skeptic is because I really do think it's, um, it's not a product like other things where you can see it's really more of an interaction between uh, students and, and teacher. And I think about my own teaching. When it's working well, it's not something I'd ever be able to pick up when I'm on video. Um, I think it's the hard part is not designing what you're going to say in advance and preparing your materials. It's how you react when things don't go the way you would have predicted. And you don't know how to react if you're not making a connection with people in the room. And, and so I think there are lots of innovations having to do with technology that I, that I think of as having uh, putting the right people together. But I'm very skeptical that we can do what we're doing with fewer, with less personal contact. I actually think that's one of the essential elements. And so to me, when I've the stuff, work I've done on online education, I typically see it as you're spending less to get less, not you're spending the same to get less. I don't, I don't see much evidence that online education is increasing efficiency. The really high quality online education models are very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's kind of gimmicky a lot of times, not all the time. Um, and it's an effort to look for a shortcut, which I totally understand given the world we're living in, but I, I haven't seen anything that uh, I, I, that one thing I'll say is um, this is kind of history of technology. If you look at not just education but other places, typically we think of technology as going to like replace us. You know, robots are going to take all of our jobs. And that's never what happens. Instead, it changes the nature of the job. And so you might predict, I think, accurately that um, when you know Raj Chetty or whoever superstar lecturer takes my place on an economics of education class, like my role will be to work with the students to help meet them where they are and be more of a coach and a mentor and less of a lecturer on a big stage. And so that's not a story about replacing people, it's a story about changing what people do. I do think to our conversation about marginal dollars, I think one of the things that frustrates me about this is that, you know, there's a lot of articles about the $100 million, you know, however much it was in, in California. Fewer articles about the CSU program, the Cal State program, which imploded, right, and is gone. And those resources are gone. Or the University of Texas's Center on Innovation and Learning, I'm going to get it wrong, but now shuttered, right, $90 million. So, I mean, there are, to, to David's point, there are things that, that there are, there's a lot more pockmarks on that road, I think, than there are successes. And so I think it's, we're, we're struggling with this in our system right now. Um, how, what's the play? How do you use it effectively? Yeah. So, I, I would like to see it used as a quality play, but it's typically an efficiency and access play. And 
I think until faculty get involved in having a goal for teaching and learning and start to realize that online education or technology-aided education can actually help them achieve the teaching and learning goals they have, it's going to continue to be used that way. And, and I think typically these things are used on college campuses as sort of a skunk works or seen as by faculty as not related to them or a way to create efficiency for them. So it, I, it's too broad a brushstroke. I'm sure there, Candace Thiel's doing great work, um, uh, or she was until she went to Amazon, um, uh, out at Stanford working with colleges to use it as a quality. I think it's got great potential to improve quality, but I agree with, with the other panelists that by and large, it's not being used to improve quality, and that's going to require getting faculty engaged in defining what they want to do to improve teaching and, and learning and using technology to adapt to that. And a really great question. I mean, I, yeah. I just wish we had more time. We could do a whole okay. ask with that's a just good. on online education <laughs> yeah. and higher education. Um, but please join me in thanking our panelists this evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.